turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 14. And uh, on Sunday, when we on Sunday when we were in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and uh, we had finished the last verse that we handled on Sunday, and that was verse 11, where I read, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. When I read that, I thought of a few things, and one of the things I thought of was this Wednesday night study and all of you. And uh, I thought about the fact that, you know, we're called to study it tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so the King James says, study to present yourself approved. So it's the idea of studying in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. And so, you know, in, in being able to rightly, you know, give an answer uh, is also how we make disciples, right? Having an answer, sharing, sharing the word. And so, and so when we finish that verse, just as you also are doing, I thought, I thought of um, you all, and studying the word on Wednesday night, and um, and I also thought of those who pray. You know, uh, our prayer teams, our prayer warriors, some of which I know that uh, they pray in their prayer closets, but to but to just continue to do that and to be encouraged, and that's how we we um, we also fight the good fight of faith. And that's how we're equipped for the battle because it tells us that uh, we're to take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So once again, engaged in the battle, taking the sword of the spirit. And uh, that's how we know to resist the devil. You know, in James, it tells us that if you submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee, flee from, uh, from you. You know, we know that's how that happens. That's by, by the word of God. We also know what God requires of us by the word, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So we know that by the word. And so just continue, edify one another, just as you also are doing, because, you know, it is something that the Lord shows us to do, and uh, when we're going through the Old Testament, it's not always easy, right? Some of the parts are a little bit more difficult, and, but it's necessary. Uh, it's foundational to the study of the Word as we study the Old Testament because we, we get God's counsel, we, get, uh, we understand the commandments of the Lord, and, and also we learn the nature of our God. And, and so we you know, we, we learn that because God doesn't change. And so when we study the Old Testament, we're learning so much about the nature of God and uh, it's so important. And so, and so we land in uh, the 14th chapter of 2 Kings. And, um, and so as we're going through this, this section, um, the record's going to flip back and forth from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom, the northern, the northern kings and the southern kings will be going back and forth. And so we read in verse 1, in the second year of Joash, the son of, the son of Je Jehoahaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, became king. And so it's a little strange when you think about it because now uh, Israel's king, the king of the north, is named the same name as the prior king of, of Judah, kind of like a, like a brand, you know, and jo Joash. And uh, using the same names, it's certainly not a coincidence that he was named the same name as the king in 
in Judah because they recycled names. And they were all from the same heritage, the, 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 those in, in the north and those in the south. And so, and so these were names that, um, that were part of their heritage. And I know like in my family, you know, names are, are recycled. You know, I have um, uh, my grandfather on both sides is named Anthony. I have an uncle who's named Anthony to Christopher. I have a cousin named Anthony to Christopher. I have uh, a son <laughs> named Anthony to Christopher. And I have a grandson named Anthony to Christopher. So it's not unusual that names are recycled. And, um, and so on both sides, you know, we have that name being used a lot. And so, um, and so we ha we'll have that going on. And so, so Joash, uh, he was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. So a long time. His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like his father David. He did everything as his father Joash had done. And so, um, and so he did do good things, Joash. He did, you know, it says there, he did what was right in the sight of the, of the Lord. He was flawed. Um, by learned behavior, by what his father had done, he followed suit. And, and we know that, no doubt, that fathers, uh, the children watch the fathers very closely and carefully. And I remember years ago when I married into the family, I had a brother-in-law who married into one of Alandrina's sister's. And I remember knowing him for a couple of years, and I would watch him, and he had this strange sort of quirk that he moved his lip a certain way or just an expression. I thought, oh, well, that's just a strange kind of an expression. But then I went to Mexico. When I went to Mexico, I met his father. That's exactly what his father did. It was something I've never seen before. He watched his father so carefully, he even came up with the same little lip, you know, motions and all. And because that's what kids do. You know, they learn. They learn the, the practical as well as the spiritual, manners, habits, culture, all of that, as well as watching the mother for sure. But although um, we try to influence our children the best we can, sons and daughters can do their own thing, go their own way. Uh, but as long as, you know, we're faithful to the Lord, that's what matters. And, of course, we have the commandment of Scripture uh, from... <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 9 through 11, it says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in sub subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Uh, now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so, you know, the Lord's a faithful uh, heavenly father that uh, does what's necessary in our lives. Um, Ephesians, Paul writes, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first command with promise that it may be well with you and, you and that you may live long on the earth. And, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to the wrath, but, being, uh, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So we have a commandment to be the best example that we can because our children are going to be watching us. And I always add to that grandparents as well. And I think that we have a very similar uh, responsibility with our grandchildren and a great uh, privilege to minister to them. So there was a learned behavior because it says that yet not like his father David. And so he was in the line of David and it's sad, but it's better that we don't have a, that we're, that our testimony is free, free of the, the, the yets and the buts. 
you know, we don't have a yet, a yet or a but in our testimony. Um, but it says, uh, that not like his father, David. And so the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. The apostle Paul even says uh, in, in, in one place in Acts 13, when he's talking about how Saul has removed the first king of Israel, and he says, and when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And so basically, Joash wasn't following David, but he was following his father, who was compromised. Now, David, on the other hand, never gave in to worship of idols. Uh, David was a sinner, but he never worshiped an idol. And uh, he, never, he never did that. He was, yet, he was flawed, but there is no non, nobody is a non-sinner. A non-sinner has never lived except for Jesus Christ. But yet David never worshipped an idol. He only worshipped the Lord, and he answered only to the Lord. But Joash was not fully committed, and, and, and he was compromised, because if you look at verse 4, it says, However, the high places were not taken away, and the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. And so there, uh, if you remember, the sin of Jeroboam was that, that he... Uh, provided a place for the people to worship way in the north, in Dan, and way in the south, uh, places for them to worship so they didn't have to go to uh, Jerusalem. Well, in the south, there also was high places. And the people would would go and they would worship God in the high places, but the law said the only place that they could do these sacrifices were in Jerusalem. So it was a compromise to worship in these high places, but the people did do that. And even worshiping Jehovah God in the high places, it wasn't acceptable. The acceptable place to go was Jerusalem. So it was a compromise. It was like a convenience. Oh, why go all the way to Jerusalem? Just worship here. This is a place where we can worship. And so, and so we don't, you know, you know, when we're serving the Lord, we're not supposed to be serving uh, only by convenience. We're to be serving by command, the commandment of the Lord. And if something happens to be not convenient, that's okay if it's directed by the Lord. Oh, it's such a hassle to go to church. We'll just watch online. You know, no, the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. So, you know, it's not okay. Now, if there's a reason that you have to watch online, that's different. But because it's a hassle, oh, it's cold outside or, you know, couldn't have victory over the sheets or whatever, you know, no, that's not good. And so we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be going that way. And so, and so they worshiped on the high place. That was a compromise. Now it happened as soon as the, the kingdom was established in his hand that he executed his servants who had murdered his father, the king. And so as soon as he had, you know, that official position as king, that green light, he went and he killed all of those that executed, executed all those that murdered his father. And uh, I always like movies like that, where the bad guys get it. You know, they murdered his father, and as soon as he became king, he executed all of them. They were done. They got theirs. But the children of the murderers, he did not execute. According to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, and so it's cool because Amaziah was, you know, referring to God's word, which is really good. Because in the book of the law of Moses, in which the Lord commanded, saying, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. 
but a person shall be put to death for his own sin. That's going back to Deuteronomy 24. And so he's following that command of scripture, which is not was typically what they did in those days. They wiped out anybody that could be a threat then and anybody that could be a threat in the future. And any servants that could be a threat and any any uh, you know military leaders, they just wiped out everybody that could be a threat. But instead, he didn't. He, he, he wiped out the guilty ones that were directly the murderers and then left their children alive by, by the commandment of the Lord. And so, so then it says there in verse 7, he, he killed 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt and took Selah, that was the ancient city of Petra, Selah, by war, and, call, and called its name Jokthil, Jokthil in this day, to this day, which would be the day that that was written. But the uh, Jokathil, I think it's how it's pronounced, it means blessedness of God. And so he went in, destroyed 10,000 of the enemy, and, um, and then he took Selah, which is the, the ancient city of Petra, but he called it the name uh, Jokathil which means blessedness of God. So he was acknowledging that it was by God's hand that, that he had the victory, but there's a very sad backdrop to what happens next. Um, and it's recorded in Second Chronicles 25, starting with uh, verse 14, where it says this account, now it was, so after Amaziah, came from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, set them up to be his gods and bowed down before them and burned incense to them. The gods of the Edomites that he just destroyed. So therefore the anger of the Lord was aroused against Amaziah and he sent him a prophet who said to him, why have you sought the gods of the people which could not rescue their, their own people from your hand? So it was as he talked with him that the king said to him, have, you, have we made you the king's counselor? Cease. Why should you be killed? Then the prophet ceased and said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not heeded my advice. And so after God had given him the victory, he began to worship the gods of the people that he destroyed. And God was very angry at that. And so we see here that Amaziah, verse 8, sent messengers to, to Joash, uh, you know, this name goes back and forth. It's either Joash or Jehoash. Because if you see in verse 1, it's Joash. And then here you see it's jo Jehoash. So I'm just going to say Joash, okay? Rather than to confuse things. Joash, the son, the son of Jehoaz, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us face one another in battle. And so it's a declaration of war. Joash is declaring war on, uh, on the king in the north, the king, king of Israel. And so um, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu. So he's declaring, come, let us face one another in battle, declaration of war. And, uh, and so, and so he's, he's being prideful. You know, we... Um, we know that he's not tracking any longer with the Lord, and so he's being prideful. Now he wants to go against, um, you know, the king in, in the north. And so we know what the Bible says about that, that, you know, being, being led by pride, what a pride, in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Also in Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. So he's being prideful. He challenges the king in the north, 
and then and then uh, and Joash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, so he gives this little parable uh, that he sends, and he says the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar. So you have a little bush sent to the mighty tree. So obviously he's going to be referring to uh, to Amaziah as the little bush in Judah, and then him as the mighty tree. Uh, and so and and, and sent to uh, sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, "Give your daughter to my son as wife." So there probably was some some irritation or failed attempt to to have that marriage. And, uh, and he says, but a wild beast that was in Lebanon passed by and trampled the thistle. And so basically it's almost, I, I read this kind of like as a, as a taunt. You know, basically he's given Joash fair warning not to think this way, to come to battle against him, back off or else. And he's, you know, saying to him, you don't stand a chance against us. Matter of fact, uh, something less than Israel can take you out. He he refers to it as a wild beast can take you out. So so you have indeed defeated Edom, and your heart has lifted you up. So you're getting cocky. You're getting puffed up. So uh, you know it's obvious that Joash has noticed what's going on in the heart of Amaziah. So he's right there. You glory in that, and you you he says glory in that and stay at home. In other words, take your victory and just stay at home. For why should you meddle with trouble so that you fall, you and Judah, with you? And so jo- Joash is, you know, very confident. And, you know, we know that it's going to be the confidence that comes from God because God is going to deal with Amaziah because of what he did, worshiping the very idols of the Edomites that God gave him victory over. And so... And so we have um, verse 11, but Amaziah would not heed. So even though he's hearing wise counsel from Joash, he's being hard-headed, prideful. You know, here this evil king of Israel was in fact correct on his assessment. And, um, and what's key to notice here is that you see Amaziah, do you see him praying anywhere? You seeing seeking, you know, God's will anywhere? No. Matter of fact, if he had been, it would have been recorded. That's the kind of things that the Bible makes note of. But instead, it's just presump- presumption and pride, and he's actually worshiping idols. We get that. What's interesting, though, is that <clears throat> what if we didn't have the record of Second Chronicles? chapter 25 that gives us more detail what if we just had this account and then when we see in this account you have Amaziah did what was right in the sight of the Lord and then you have Joash who did evil in the sight of the Lord and now we're going to see that um, therefore Joash king of Israel went out so he and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced one another at Beth Shemesh, which belonged to Judah. So he came down into Judah's territory. It was about 15 miles west of Jerusalem. And uh, Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his tent. Then Joash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Ahaziah at Beth Shemesh and he went to Jerusalem and he broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate 400 cubits so about 600 foot of the northern wall of Jerusalem knocked it down and he took all the gold and silver and all the articles that were found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house and the hostages and returned to Samaria And so here, Joash was saying, hey, ready to leave the whole thing alone, but Amaziah was the instigator. Amaziah was the one that was doing right in the eyes of the Lord until 
he destroyed the Edomites. He got all puffed up with pride, and he began to worship the idols. And, um, and so then he was destroyed by the wicked king of Israel. So now, what if we didn't have the account in Second Chronicles 25? What would you think here? Lord, why would you let an evil king destroy a good king? Why would you allow that to happen? And if we didn't have the account, what we should know is that God has his reasons. And oftentimes we might not know what those reasons are, but we, but we understand that God' judgment is right always. And so, but here we do know why. And so now the, the rest of the acts of Joash, which he did, his might and how he fought with Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Yes, we just read a little bit of that, right? So Joash rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Then Jeroboam, his son, reigned in his place. So his son was named Jeroboam, who was named after the, the founder of their very evil, you know, kingdom, Jeroboam. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived 15 years after the death of Joash, the son of Jehoaz, king of Israel. And so more than likely now, he was released after Joash's death by Jeroboam, which would be Jeroboam II. And uh, he lived 15 years after Joash had died. Now the rest of the acts of Amaziah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And they formed a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, but they sent after him to Lachish, and killed him there. Then they brought him on horses, and he was buried at Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. And uh, all the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. And so Azariah was raised up in, in after Amaziah, his father. But it's interesting to make note of is Azariah, his name it will be also Uzziah. And, and it's, it's uh, uh, also a name change that will take place, Uzziah. So Azariah is also Uzziah, which his name will come up. And so, uh, so now we... Um, we're back in uh, Israel, Jeroboam II, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Ju Judah. Jeroboam, again Jeroboam II, the son, of, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. That's the longest reigning king in uh, the north. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the one he was named after, the son of Debat, who had made Israel sin. So the founder of their wicked uh, kingdom. And again, you know, as I mentioned, this very well could be the bumper sticker for all the kings of Israel. They could have a little bumper sticker on their chariot that described all the kings of Israel. Unlike the kings of Judah, where you would get periodically the good kings in Judah, you had no good kings in the north and so they all did evil in the sight of the lord and so um and so he re and and so and so he restored the territory of israel uh, from the entrance of hamath to the sea of arba and uh, hamath was about 150 miles north of the sea of galilee and then you have uh, the Sea of Arba, which is the Dead Sea. So it was a huge area that he restored uh, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath, 
Hepfer. And so it was God's plan, and, um, and it was in, in, in his word, was being fulfilled. The word came through Jonah, yeah, Jonah, the one that was swallowed by a great fish. I know that we, we typically would say, Jonah swallowed by a whale. No, Jonah was, was swallowed by a great fish that was prepared by the Lord. Now, uh, I think a whale's different than a fish, as I understand it. <laughs> but it was prepared in a special way. But, you know, um, you know, maybe it was a whale. I mean, I don't know. But I know that people have actually been swallowed by a whale and actually lived to tell it. Uh, there's an account where a dog fell overboard and a, a whale swallowed a dog. And then three days later, that whale was harpooned. And as they're pulling in the whale, they hear barking. And the, the dog got up into the nasal cavity of the whale and stayed alive for three days in the, in the whale. So it's kind of interesting. But, but yeah, this is Jonah. Now, contemporary to Jonah were other prophets at the time. Um, there was Isaiah that was prophesying at the time, and also Hosea, and also Amos. And so you had these prophets coming on the scene, speaking to the king, speaking prophecy, the word. And so the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was so very bitter, and um, whether bond or free, there was no helper for Israel. And the Lord did not, and and the Lord did not say that He would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. And so again, God uses armies and nations to save his people by his discretion and by his direct intervention, even when it's the evil people, the evil nations saving, you know, the saving the people. You know, God always has his remnant. And, uh, you know, he used the U.S., the United States of America, to save his people in World War II. And so God uses nations. And I, for one, believe that's why this nation was even raised up with the foundation that it was. Because God was going to use this nation as an army to go globally and do his bidding, which we have. And we've been fair in, in war. We've rebuilt countries that were our enemy. And, you know, that's never the case. Usually conquering countries always take the whole country and all their resources. Instead, we would conquer them and help them rebuild. I mean, who does that? The United States of America does. We had a different foundation than other countries. But God, I believe, raised up this country for that purpose. And it's sad, but like any country, you know, you have, you have um, that evil element. And so he uh, saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did, his might and how he made war and how he recaptured, uh, uh, he recaptured for Israel from Damascus and Hamath and and had belonged to Judah, are, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles, the kings of Israel? So Jeroboam rested with his fathers, the kings of Israel. Then Zechariah, the son, his son reigned in, in, his, in his place. And so now we have in chapter 15, uh, back to the south. Come from the north, now we're back to the south. And so in the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, so the king that had just just died, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. He was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jacqueliah of Jerusalem. And so he was the longest reigning king in the south. And so... Um, and then Azariah, remember, is Uzziah also. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done, except 
And it would be good not to have any exceptions like this in our testimony, the buts, except that the high places were not removed, the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. And, um, and so there's a sad backdrop here again I have to read concerning Azariah, also Uzziah was his name, but if you read in 2 Chronicles 26, starting with verse 16, but when he was strong in his heart, when he, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense, So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense, get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed, you shall, you, you shall um, have no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous, so that they thrust him out of the, that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was king over, over the king's house, judging the people of the land." What a sad account. He was puffed up. He went into the temple where the only way you can go into the temple like like that is you have to have Levi jeans. You cannot go into the temple without Levi jeans. Just to let you know. You had to be a Levi priest. And that had to be your heritage. You could not go in there and sacrifice without having Levi jeans. And so... You know, he thought it was all about him. And so he went in, and you know, it tells us in Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. And we see that throughout the history in the Bible. You know, remember Nebuchadnezzar when he tried to take the glory, and he ended up being seven years out like a wild man in the field until he was restored and he came to repentance. But, you know, but we have this account of of Azariah. And so then the Lord, so we see it now, verse 5, then the Lord struck the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death. Now we just read that account. Now, it's interesting because if you're just reading this account, you would see that, you know, the people still sacrificed. You know, he, he did right what was in the sight of the Lord and so forth. And then all of a sudden, with the Lord struck the king with leprosy, what's that all about? Well, we just read what it was all about, but it's not recorded here. But see, the thing is, is the principle is it doesn't matter. The Lord had its reason. We might not know what that reason is. And I say that, more, more in the practical sense of our, 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 our day-to-day, serving the Lord. Sometimes we look at things and we go, man, Lord, what were you thinking? I don't know. We, we, I don't know the backdrop. I don't know what's going on. I don't know who's involved. But the Lord's always right in his judgment. And, and, and that's where we have to be in our theology. Otherwise, we can get rattled. The devil surely will come in and try to deceive us. And so he had, um, you know, a great beginning but just because somebody has a great beginning doesn't necessarily mean he's going to have a great ending. And sadly, I know personally several who had good beginnings but not good endings. And it's sad. It's heartbreaking. Because once again, they get puffed up. God does a great and mighty thing, 
and suddenly it's all about them. And that's what I so appreciate about my pastor. And, you know, Rick and I were talking about it earlier. And if you haven't seen, um, you know, my, I mean my pastor, Chuck Smith, but if you haven't seen the memorial for Jeff Johnson, go on, go on uh, YouTube, Calvary Chapel Downey, and watch that. It is amazing. And once again, one of the things he said to Art, who he turned over, what a wonderful man. I didn't know him, but what he shared was probably the most phenomenal stuff at the memorial in, in, in his honor of Pastor Jeff. But one of the things that Pastor Jeff did is after he, he handed over this, I don't know, 10,000 people church, he would come and he would sit in the back. And Art would be preaching, and you'd see him back there. And sometimes he wasn't able to talk to him, so he'd call him Sunday night. said, hey, Pastor Jeff, what would you think of the service? He says, I think it was the most wonderful service I've ever been to. And then he said to Art, the new pastor, he says, you know what I can't wait for? I can't wait till I come in here and nobody even knows who I am. Because it isn't about me. This church belongs to the Lord. And his heart was that the church would continue like that. Just incredible, and it's almost four hours long, but I really recommend that you would watch it because everybody that was coming up, it was kind of interesting because everybody that was coming up uh, was there after me. I was there before and watched the initial work of the Lord, and then when we see his kids come up, Alandrina was their Sunday school teacher. And so, you know, we have an investment in, in memory back there when we were young Christians, and so just incredible. But the thing is, somebody, you know, might have a good beginning, but not a good ending. And that's what I was, I was getting to as we, my, my past, Pastor Chuck Smith, God was able to use him for this incredible worldwide ministry, and he never wanted any, he wanted nothing to do with touching the glory. He gave all the glory to the Lord, and he was always sending everybody out. Go, 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 and, you know, and and there was, within a small period of time, there was almost 3,000 churches, 2,500 at one point. And since his passing now, that were 50% more churches added since 2013. And so that's what it's all about. And then somehow these kings just make it all about them. And God says, no, that ain't going to happen. Judgment comes. And it comes in this life as well. And so, and so we have um, till his death. So he dwelt in an isolated house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the royal house judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles, the kings of Judah? Yeah, we just read that. So Azariah rested with his fathers and they buried him with his fa fathers in the city of David. Then Joth Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. So, you know, they were co-reigning co at the time, but he had to stay in isolation. And in the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, so he still had 14 years left. Uh, so now we're back, you know, in the north. So we're just in the south. Now we're back in the north. Uh, Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reigned over Israel in Samaria six months. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his, as his fathers had done. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Debat, who had made Israel sin. So once again, that bumper sticker. Then Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and struck and killed him in the front of the people. And he reigned in his place. He just killed him right there in front of the people. And now the rest of the acts of Zechariah, Indeed, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. So Zechariah was the fourth king in the line of Jehu. So God's word came true. It says, this was the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Jehu, saying, your son shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And so it was. So there was that fulfillment of the prophecy that was given back in, in the 10th chapter. And so... Um, Shalom, the son of Jabesh, the king, uh, became king in the 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah, and he reigned a full month in Samaria. So, so outside of Zimbri, Zimbri, which goes back to from the first Kings, chapter 16, Zimbri was only uh, king for seven days. This was the shortest reign, a full month. 
for, for uh, Menahem, the son of Gadi, went up from Tirzah, came to Samaria, and struck Shalom, the son of Jabesh, the, and in Samaria, and killed him. And he reigned in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Shalom and the conspiracy which he led, indeed, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. Uh, then from Tirzah, Menahem attacked Tibsha, all, were, all who were there in its territory, because they did not surrender. Therefore he attacked it, and all the women there who were with child he ripped open. So once again, wicked, evil, terrible, horrible people. Even the Assyrians were known for doing this, but this is the king of Israel. Sad, ruthless, and brutal. And uh, it sounds like the same spirit lives in Hamas today, putting infants in ovens and cooking them alive besides all the horrible things like this that they would do. And so it has been throughout all history that you have evil people that do these kind of wicked things, even in modern time, and it's, you know, it's, um, it's sad. I remember the Manson family of 19, 1969, we who were old enough. And matter of fact, Pam and Penny said that they were in that area, they lived in the area where the Manson family had their little ranch out there and actually was in a store one time when they came in and they were, you know, younger, but they remember Manson looking right at them, and he says, they said it was just this most horrific look that he had, uh, you know, and uh, and sure enough, they went in, killed people, you know, and killed, um, oh, what's her name, uh, Sharon Tate, who was pregnant nine months, and they stabbed her, and they didn't cut, cut her open, uh, but... They killed her along with the, the others that were there. And, you know, some, some say that, um, you know, modern man is getting better. No, that's so untrue. Modern man is not getting better. Modern man is as wicked as, as any men have ever been. And if you give people power and uh, armies, that's the kind of stuff that, that they will do. And so then we have in verse 17, in the 39th year, again, a point of reference, 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, the son of Gadi, became king over Israel and reigned 10 years in Samaria. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Debat, who had made Israel sin. Again, that bumper sticker. Paul, king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem... Uh, gave Paul a thousand talents of silver, 37 tons of silver, that his hand might be with him to strengthen the king under his control. Then Menahem exacted the money from Israel from all the very wealthy. Strange, huh? You don't want to tax the wealthy to pay for his ransom debt? Who would ever think that they would try and do that? being facetious of course he exacted the money from israel from all the very wealthy <clears throat> from each man 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of assyria so the king of assyria turned back and did not st stay there in the land now the rest of the acts of menahem and all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of israel so Men menahem rested with his fathers then Pekahiah, the son, uh, his son reigned in his place. Pekahiah, I don't know. That's a tough name. Pekahiah. Well, Pekahiah, the fifth, in the fifth, 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, so another point of reference, he has two years left. Uh, Pe Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned two years, not very long, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Debet, who had made Israel 
sin. Now, interesting, because why is this repeated so much? Why does the Bible repeat that so much? Because uh, the point is, is that these, each one, are making their own choices to follow in the sin that they were raised in. And so, in a sense, this is an example of genu- generational uh, curse. But what's important to understand is that a generational curse is always because of the sin of those being judged. It's not, you know, and, and, and you know, I have, to re- I have to read in Ezekiel 18 where uh, it tells us uh, clearly, yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and, ob- and observed them. He shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. Uh, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he has he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them, he shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O Israel, is it not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he has committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive. Because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed, he shall surely live and he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? I mean, I had to read the whole thing at length. Because that's the character and nature of our God. And so all these kings, time and time again, are guilty of their own sin And even though it's a generational curse because it keeps referring back to Jeroboam who initially set the foundation of that evilness, it was them repeating it. But we know here in in Ezekiel 18, God's nature. If they repented, they would have been forgiven. They would have been set on a whole different foundation. But none of them did. And so... And so once again, in verse... 24 the reason and he did evil in the sight of the lord and that's why there was that continuous same choice you had the continual same sin and so um and so my down 23 there i think in the 50th year of azariah king of judah uh, Pekaniah, the son of Men- uh, Menahem, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned two years. And then, okay, I, I did read that. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not depart from the sin of Jeroboam, son of Debat, who had made Israel sin. Then Pekah, the son of Remaliah, an officer of his, conspired against him and killed him in Samaria in the citadel of the king's house along with Argob and Araya, and with him were 50 men of Gilead. He killed, he killed him and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Pe- Pekahiah and all that he did, indeed, they are written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And so one wicked reign after another, one wicked takeover after another takeover. 
And so we certainly see why the position of the cupbearer was developed because everybody's trying to kill the kings and we also know the danger of what it was to be a cupbearer because of the constant trying to kill of the various kings. But you know what? Our country is no stranger to assassinations. And people do continue to make that false claim that modern man is getting more civilized. Who believes that? I mean, we have assassinations after assassinations that went on in this country. And still, we don't know how many people are killed that just suddenly come up, turn up dead, coincidentally after standing up for, against, you know, some, some criminal and so forth, or some political power of some sort. You know, it happens. It happens even in this country, but certainly around the world. People are being killed. And so we are going to end there because we're, we're out of time. But, but anyway, once again, you know, we, uh, as you can see plainly here, that we begin to see how God deals with sin and wickedness and yet will speak his word and give a heads up and minister to the people. And, and we, we learned that those who would repent, that God would forgive and not remember their sins and will move them forward on a, on a good footing. And, and they could be right with God. And so, um, and so you know, sometimes um, you know, we're put in positions where we can think more of ourselves than we should. <laughs> And think about it. When somebody all of a sudden becomes a celebrity or becomes, you know, power, have a powerful position in a corporation or whatever, you see the temptation that could come against them? Or pastors of really, you know, huge churches that are just mega churches and suddenly they get puffed up and the enemy gets in there and then they fall. And so... Um, I think that the temptation is very real even in our lives where we're challenged day to day to think that we're better than somebody else. And we have to be careful because you know what? The Bible says without Jesus, we can do nothing. And so we have to stay in that humble place, realizing, you know, Lord, I'm not even worthy, you know, to be in the place that I'm, I'm at. And just recognize it's all about serving the Lord and, and humility. God, God resists the proud, but he raises up the humble. And so the Lord wants to us to be faithful in what we are given, and that he then can do even more with us if he chooses. But if not, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's what the Lord wants of us. Daily be faithful to the things that he's given to us. Amen? Thank you, Lord, uh, again for your word, and we, we ask that you would continue to, to grow our faith, Lord, and to trust you, even when it just seems like things should be different at times, but Lord, to trust you. I know that, you know, this brings health uh, to our, not only our spiritual being, but to our very physical being. You know, as your word said, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil, and it shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. And so, Lord, we trust you. We trust you that we're bulletproof until we're out of here. Uh, Lord, we also pray that we would remain mobile until you're done with us, and that you would strengthen us uh, for the work at hand. Lord, fill us to overflowing with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? God bless you.